shooting the aftermath of Snowzilla, landscape photography tips, and easy slideshows right on your iPad. Hey everyone, welcome to Keep Shooting Monday number 118. My name is Greg Cazillo from Cazillo.com. So hopefully everyone here on the Eastern Seaboard, Sneeboard, Seaboard <laughs> in the United States made it through Snowzilla. There were a ton of photos, a ton of snow here on the East Coast. I am in southeastern Pennsylvania, and I think we probably had about 30 inches around here, 24 to 30 inches. Definitely a lot of snow, a lot of uh, just a, a very interesting weekend, to say the least, uh, over the last 48 hours. So uh, it was fun. I'm still achy from all the stuff that I was doing, all the work, but that's the way it goes. It was it was interesting. It's something to live live through. Uh, always a good experience. So always fun in my mind. I don't, I don't mind a little challenge here and there. So uh, a little bit of show stuff today. First, we had a question last week that I had talked about with uh, Aperture Priority, whether you guys use Aperture Priority and then the Compact Flash versus SD. Seems like the consensus as far as the, the memory cards was, whatever your camera uses, you use. There doesn't seem to be a preference one way or the other. As far as Aperture Priority versus Shutter Priority, it definitely seemed like more people prefer to use Aperture Priority similar to the way that I shoot, which is a good thing. I think that, uh, that people are thinking about that and, and using it the right way, so that's a good thing. There was one comment that Bob uh, mentioned. He will use shutter priority when he's on a boat, and I do think that's a good idea because you are going to have more motion. You're going to be rocking up and down, especially if there's a lot of waves and a lot of wind that day. So uh, I think there are times when you're moving, maybe on a vehicle, those kinds of times when you might prefer to use your shutter priority. If you still wanted to use aperture priority, you just might need to bump up your ISO a little bit in order to get a better, um, to make sure that your, your shutter speed stays a little bit higher. And that's the same thing that I do with sports. Just make sure that my ISO is in a decent range. What I'll do is I'll, I'll point my camera to the shadow area and uh, see where my lowest shutter speed is and then point it to the brightest area, see where my, my highest shutter speed is going to be and then set my ISO accordingly, making sure that I'm in a good range. That's, a, that's an easy tip for you. I created a really simple slideshow with Adobe Premiere Clip. It's a nice, simple app that allows you to put some, either I've only really used it for a couple different slideshows, both for clients, um, but it was so much easier than doing it with, um, with like Premiere because I had Premiere and I use it. The big reason why is because it automatically sets the timing of the photos to the beat of the songs. That is such a huge thing on top of say just regular Lightroom, you know, cause you can do a slideshow out of Lightroom or doing it manually, setting a single timing for each, each photo. Yeah, it's okay, it'll work. But if you really get, wanna give a better impact, you're better off have, setting that beat and working with that beat. And so it uh, is a really cool technology. Uh, it automatically um, includes the songs in there. You can add photos from, say, your camera roll, or if you're using Lightroom Mobile, you can add photos from there, just add a collection, and then they'll, they'll automatically sync over. Like I said, automatically sets that timing to the beat of the songs. You can add crossfades between photos. You can export it all to Creative Cloud when you're done. And you, if you do have a Adobe Premiere, you can then have a little bit of a leg up to then do other things with it or add it in, so that's really cool. Uh, when you're exporting, you can save that to your camera roll, uh, then upload to any social like Facebook or whatever. You can share directly to YouTube. Uh, there's a ton of other things in this app. Definitely check it out. From what I can tell, it does not require any subscription. You just need to have a free Adobe ID. Uh, you don't have to actually pay for the app. It's a free one from what I can tell. If someone could log in and download that and let me know for sure, I will definitely mention it on next week's show. That'd be really cool. So um, one thing that I'd like to see added into this app is allowing me to layer on a logo or layer on text on top of those images. 
that would have saved me from having to export it into Premiere, then add that text and add a logo, and then export it again after that. So uh, that'd be one of the things that I would definitely add to that, and hopefully Adobe is listening, and we can get them added in there. So let's talk about shooting in the snow. Like I was talking about, there was a ton of snow here on the East Coast of the United States, and um, I had actually done a tip on that probably, gosh, I bet you this is two years old, this video is two or three years old, we talked about shooting in the snow, you can click over and, and uh, watch that video if you'd like. The main tips in there are uh, you need to overexpose by about a stop, maybe even a stop and a half in order to make sure you have proper exposure. The best way to make sure you have proper exposure is to check your histogram. You've got to be checking your histogram when you're out shooting. And so make sure you're, make sure that's in good shape. Um, as always, anything photography is always a good rule of thumb. But, so make sure you understand the rules and how things work and then go and start breaking them and do things intentionally. So start out by practicing those rules, do it the, a good way, push that histogram to the right, make sure there's no flat spot on the right side of it. And um, then if you still want to, then underexpose. Maybe if you did need to saturate some colors, you want a little bit different feel, uh, maybe use your auto bracketing on your camera. If you're doing landscape stuff, that could be a good way to go too. Um, if you're using an auto mode, it's okay to use exposure compensation in this instance. If you're using that aperture priority, that'd be fine. When you're on manual mode though, do not touch that exposure compensation. It's a bad idea. I don't recommend using it at all. Um, you're better off just doing it manually because all it's doing is adjusting your meter and then you might forget and leave it on. Then you'll have other things that are over or underexposed. Totally not worth it. It's not like it's going to adjust the amount of light or anything like that. So if you're shooting in manual, stick with manual and just pay attention to your meter and overexpose that way. That's the right way to go. So um, I think that is it. So let's get into a few gazillion questions. Peter Murphy Sorry, I forgot to move my monitors back for you. So let me do that for you to get rid of the gap. Peter commented, there you go, Peter. Peter commented, I can't concentrate on what you're saying this time, Greg. The gap between your monitors is driving me nuts. So he kind of admitted that he's a little bit OCD and I would definitely say that that's the case. Anyway, there you go, Peter, I fixed that for you. Zuni asks, why don't photographers have strobes constantly on so it counts as ambient light and go from there? Well, Zuni, having a strobe allows us to have a much more compact package because what happens is, is those batteries refill a capacitor and that capacitor can store a lot of energy and put it out for a short amount of time. That allows our strobes and all the, the whole package to be very lightweight, very easy to use and uh, cost less money. Whereas if we were trying to get you know, all that light, you know, 10 stop range of light out of a single package and a continuous package, it's going to be very, very expensive. So uh, whether you're using an LED, whatever kind of bright source you're using, it would be super expensive in order to make that. And it's also going to be big and unwieldy. So uh, that's going to be the way it would go. Plus, it would not no longer be called a strobe. It would be called a continuous light, which it wouldn't be a strobe anymore. So that's the answer to that question. Question about wedding photography. I really want to do this, but I'm scared about screwing up. I'm a very experienced shooter, but mentally I'm a mess about this. Any thoughts? So as you can see in his question from a Nikon, a guy, 1960, and if he says 1960 in his uh, name, it sounds like he is an experienced shooter, probably an older gentleman. So anyway, uh, he had said that he would never, he, he had some bad experience with some weddings and he would never shoot them again. And so, um, with something like this, it comes down to one thing and that's your gut. If you know, if, if your gut says yes, do it, then you're probably going to do a great job and it won't be a problem. But if your gut's telling you, no, stay away from it. That's the best thing to do is just go with your gut, see how you feel, um, and you know, kind of sleep on it for a day or two and then make the decision. If you really, really need the money and you're a starving artist and you're, you're gonna push through it and you need to do it, great. Then it's, it's, it's worth it and you make it happen and you do what you have to do in order to make the money. If you're just a hobbyist and you're, you, know, you, you have a bad feeling about it, then um, 
this skip it. You know, I mean, you're you're better off saying no, letting someone else do it, or or working as a second shooter, letting someone else do the primary work, and uh, or you take photos and then let them do the business part. If that was the issue that you had with a bad experience, you know, was that bad experience gear that you're now better at, or was that bad experience uh, the business part of it in the end? So uh, it, it kind of depends, but uh, bottom line is go with your gut. From Albert, Greg, I'd like to know what focus point you use when you took this photo. I like to shoot landscape photos like this. I like to use only one of the 19 focus points on my Canon 7D. In my opinion, landscape photography comes down to one thing, and that's knowing your equipment, shooting with it and experience with it. I know that's a very difficult thing to kind of quantify and put together and understand, but it's just the way it is. You, you, different lenses, different cameras, uh, different depth of fields are all going to kind of compound and make it very difficult to give you an exact science or an exact answer because your Canon 7D camera is going to act different than, say, a 5D versus my Nikons. And depending upon your lens choice, it's going to be different. And so all of those things compounding are going to, be, are, are going to make it uh, not be able to give you an exact answer. In general, uh, the smaller sensors are going to have a different depth of field than a larger sensor. A different, a wider angle lens is going to have a wider depth of field uh, versus a longer lens is going to have a shallower depth of field. So uh, then, of course, it comes down to your aperture. When your, your aperture at, say, 4, or 5, 6 is going to have a much shallower depth of field versus, say, f11, f16, something like that. In general, what I do when I'm shooting, I'll usually start at about f11 or f8 for my landscape photos, then um, shoot a bunch of photos, see what they look like, check them in the back of the camera if, if I'm really worried about it, and make sure everything's in focus. And the big thing, your question was, is where do you actually put that focus point? Well, the general rule of thumb, and again, this is a rule of thumb, this is not exact science, is to use the one-third, two-thirds rule of focus. That means that you focus about one-third of the way into the frame, and that then you will have a third of your focus depth of field uh, will be acceptably sharp, quote-unquote, in front of that point, and about two-thirds behind that point. Now, if you're shooting something that's really far away, it's not going to matter. If you're shooting, you know, like this photo where, you know, your, your uh, primary point is way out there, you're already focusing at infinity and you're at f11 or f16, something like that, it's really not going to matter. You shouldn't, it shouldn't have any issues there. Uh, if you're worried, then just shoot a range. You know, your shutter speed in a landscape photo isn't going to matter. So what? Uh, as long as you don't have anything moving in there, or if it's not a windy day, you shouldn't have any problems with, with motion. Even on a w little bit windy day, you could still get away with, say, a, you know, a 40th of a second, something like that, uh, or a 30th of a second, uh, or wait for the, the leaves to calm down and then shoot that photo. So uh, just uh, try that. Do some tests. Keep trying. Um, play with your equipment. Play with your lenses that you have. Um, Maybe even look at some photos with your camera. Um, say go on to Flickr and do some searches for Canon 7D and the lens that you have. And look at some of the images that are on there to kind of study and see what they do uh, as far as the landscape. So um, unfortunately, it's not an exact thing in photography. But uh, as I always say, keep shooting. So I'm going to sign off at that point. Hopefully it helped. If not, let me know, ask another question, and I'll gladly do my best to give you more information. Uh, so that is it for today's show, Keep Shooting Monday. This was number what one? 118. Thanks, guys. Keep shooting.